This morning's prayer is on the cream cardstock in your packets if you registered. It starts at the bottom of the first page and wraps around to the top of the second page. off-white, or maybe even white, light-colored. Is that good? Is this better? Can you hear me now? Good. Excellent. Thank you. This morning's prayer is adapted from the closing prayer of Pope John XXIII's address, which was given at the opening of the Second Vatican Council on October 11th, 1962. Almighty God, we have no confidence in our own strength. All our trust is in you. Graciously look down on these pastors of your church. Aid their counsels and their legislation with the light of your divine grace. Be pleased to hear the prayers we offer you, united in faith, in voice, in mind. Mary, help of Christians, in the mystery of the incarnation, you gave us a special token of your love. Prosper now this work of ours. By your kindly aid, bring it to a happy, successful conclusion. And do you, with St. Joseph, your spouse, the holy apostles Peter and Paul, St. John the Baptist, and St. John the Evangelist, intercede for us before the throne of God. To Jesus Christ, our most loving Redeemer, the immortal King of all peoples and all ages, be love, power, and glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Barb. Some people have asked about the banners in the hallway. Uh, there, uh, it's the word faith uh, written in the languages of the, the native peoples of Minnesota and all the immigrants that Catholic immigrants have come to Minnesota over, over the, the generations. A member of our department, Mary Twite, did that. Uh, so thank you, Mary. Sister Maureen Sullivan is a Dominican Sister of Hope from New York. She is a member of her community's vocation team, preaching promotion team, and extended leadership team. Sister Marine received her MA in Religious Studies from Manhattan College in the Bronx, and her doctorate from Fordham University, also in the Bronx. From a Midwestern guy, that sounds like she's kind of a tough woman. <laughs> After graduating from Fordham, she stayed there for two years as academic dean for freshmen, and then two more years as associate dean of the college. During that time, she taught in Fordham's Graduate School of Religion and Religious Education. She then took a position teaching theology at St. Anselm College in Manchester, New Hampshire, which sounds much more pastoral, uh, uh, where she has been for the last 23 years. Her courses at the college include Approaches to God, the Church, the Catholic Vision, and Vatican II. In addition to her teaching at St. Anselm, Sister Maureen serves as the religious, religious consultant for RCL Benzinger Publishing Company, a position that enables her to speak to catechists, Catholic school teachers, catechetical and diocesan leaders on contemporary theo theological issues. She has spoken at many conferences at this level, including the Los Angeles Religious Education Congress, the Mid-Atlantic Religion Education Congress, the Southwest Liturgical Conference, and many diocesan and local meetings. Next month, she'll be in Rome, speaking at a conference titled, Women Theologians Reread Vatican II. Later, she will be a keynote speaker at the Catholic Curriculum Corporation's annual When Faith Meets Pedagogy Conference in Toronto. Her talk is Vatican II and the New Evangelization. Sister Marine's publications include two books on Vatican II, 101 Questions and Answers on Vatican II, published in 2002, 
and The Road to Vatican II, Key Changes in Theology, published in 2007. Both are by Paulus Press. She has written a number of articles, uh, as long as my arm. Um, two years ago, Fordham University's Graduate School of Religion and Religious Education awarded her with the Sapientia at Doctrina Award, which is given to persons who have made significant contributions to the life and renewal of the Catholic Church community. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker this morning, Sister Maureen Sullivan. I should take Bernie on the road with me. <laughs> Not a lot of people get such a wonderful and kind and warm introduction. Um, I know it's customary for uh, speakers to always tell their audiences how thrilled they are to be with them, um, but I really am, all right? And you know that nuns don't lie, so it's you. <laughs> Those of you who are my age or older, you understand that. I am thrilled to be here on so many levels. Um, I'm deeply grateful to my friend and my colleague, Dr. Massimo Fagioli, who is a professor here at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, I've come to know him through our mutual interest and study of the Second Vatican Council. And I'm also grateful to the um, people here at the university who have made my welcome and my planning and my getting here, et cetera. Um, quite, quite simple and quite enjoyable. So I'm delighted for all of them, and I thank you for choosing this session to come and listen um, about something that I am quite passionate about. Um, every theologian, ha as you will know, has a particular area in theology that brings out the passion in the soul, uh, a part of the Christian story that renews them, that strengthens them, and that gives them that boost to go on and continue to be the type of you know, disciple in today's world. The more you get to know me, and certainly by the end of today's presentation, you will know that Vatican II is that topic that brings out my passion for a number of reasons. I entered my religious congregation uh, the Dominican Sisters in 1965, and the council would end three months later. And so my entire religious life, my studies as a theologian, everything I am has always had in the backdrop this Second Vatican Council. So it's only natural that somehow I needed to find out what it was, how did it impact me, um, where would I go in terms of sharing this message with others. Um, for me, Vatican II is important because I think it was one of those moments in the history of the church that I believe was a moment of grace for us, a moment when we felt touched by the presence of the risen Christ in Math Matthew's Gospel, when the risen Lord told us that he would send his spirit you know, and he would be with us until the end of days, but that he would send his spirit to teach us the truth. Now, I, as I'm always telling my students, we no longer read the Bible literally, but I also tell them those words must mean something. Um, the Second Vatican Council has been called the most important ecclesial event to have occurred for the 20th century church and beyond. Now I know from the many times that I have spoken at various places on the council, I know there are some people who may be weary about hearing about the Second Vatican Council. There are those who may think they need, who may think, who may think they know all they need to know about this council, and perhaps they just wish to uh, move forward. And there are even those who maintain that the problems in the church today were caused by this council. Obviously, I don't agree with that latter group, but I digress. When I speak about Vatican II, I often refer to an article that was written in a Catholic magazine for the 40th anniversary of the closing of the council. Um, I won't name the magazine or the author, but I did write a letter to her and the editor at the time, and um, we're no longer on speaking terms, I don't think, all right? but. Um, her comments made me a little crazy, and after I shared just a few of her words, maybe you'll understand why. In the article, the entire issue of that particular 
um, a magazine was dedicated to celebrating the 40th anniversary of the closing of the council. And then the final editorial was written by this younger woman. Um, in the article, the woman basically said, quote, look, Vatican II is over. It is a memory out of our history, just like World War II. It is in the past. And all of you who continue to call for a reform in the church based on Vatican II, well, my response is yawn. Get on with it. Get a new story if you want to rekindle the faith in today's church. So you might understand why her comments made me just a little bit crazy, all right? Um, she clearly misunderstood, I think, what Vatican II was trying to do. Another thing that I should say before I get too much into my presentation is I never want my audiences to think that I'm such a devotee of the council that I think that everything that went before the council was not good or that everything that happened after the council wasn't good. Vatican II produced, as I look out in this room, most of the people in this room. Most of the people in this room are products of two churches, a pre-Vatican II church, if we want to use that terminology, and the post-Vatican II church. It produced a John the Twenty-Third. So I never want my audiences to misunderstand my evaluation. But as I tell my students, you know, a little seven-year-old does something at the age of seven, but they won't do it again when they're 17, hopefully. <clears throat> well, the church is a human organism, divinely founded, divinely grounded, and divinely guided, but in the hands of humans. And so we have to grow as well. And so I just see Vatican II as a moment of growth and development in this magnificent institution to which we belong, the church. So after my craziness of reading that article, I came across <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a quote that I would like to share with you today. It was actually a little bit of a longer piece. It was written by Joan Chittister. And she was writing on the meaning of memory. And since my talk is entitled Memory and Reform, I thought it would fit in here. Um, I'd like to share most of that quote in its entirety because I think it speaks to what I want to say today. She says, memory is one of the most important functions of the human mind. Memory is a wild horse, unbridled, often taking us where we would not go or taking us back to where we cannot stay, however much we wish we could. However, no matter, it leaves us either pining or confused, leaving in either case, leaving us in a world unfinished in us. The young are, hear the memory in the voice of their elders and delighted by these voices or bored by them, too often miss the content behind the story. Mem memory is not about what is going on or went on in the past. It is about what is going on inside of us right this moment. It is never idle, and it never leaves us alone. There is an energy in memory that is deceiving. The assumption is that since a thing is past, it holds no meaning for us at the present moment, and nothing could be further from the truth. Whatever is still in memory is exactly what still has meaning for us. It is an indicator of the unfinished in life. It gives us a sure sign of what still has emotional significance for us. And it refuses to allow us to overlook what must yet be acknowledged if we are ever to be fully honest with ourselves. And I love this line because I am a teacher. But she says, most of all, memory is the only thing that makes us authentic teachers of the young. It is not meant to cement us in the past. It is the greatest teacher of them all. The task is to come to the point where we can trust our memories to guide us out of the past into a better future. There is nothing in conscious memory that is unimportant. When we listen to someone's memories, we come to know what worries them, what delights them, what love did to them, what rejection dampened in them, and what is left to deal with now. 
our past is to be stitched into a healthy whole in the here and the now. Now, I am grateful to Joan Chittister for that piece on memory. And of course, it can be applied genetic, uh, generically to any memory. I obviously want to apply it to the memory of Vatican II. As you will see from the next part of my presentation, there is another element that I want to highlight, which I believe might rekindle all right, the fire that we once had about the Second Vatican Council, and that is going to be a call for personal reform. In one of St. Paul's writings in the New Testament, he claims that each and every one of us is a letter from Christ, that each of us needs to be able to say, I live now, not I, but Christ lives in me. So my question is this. What would happen if we took St. Paul seriously and truly understood that our Christian vocation is to become a letter from Christ, a mediator of the sacred? These questions are really central to my presentation because on the one hand, I am going to ask you to remember an event that happened 50 years ago. But on the other hand, I'm going to underline the need for each of us to take seriously the need for personal reform in our own spiritual journeys. You all know there are many voices out there today in our church calling for reform in the church. I'm probably one of them. But that call will be quite empty if I fail to reform myself. Almost 2,000 years after St. Paul, another great believer walked among us, and that would be blessed John the 23rd. As you all know, he was elected to the papacy in October of 1958. At the time, he was about to turn um, 77. And in the minds of those who elected him, so we are told, he was expected to be a temporary pope, a placeholder, an interim pope, not someone who would make waves or shake things up in any shape or form. And yet three months after his election, he called a new ecumenical church council. He hoped Vatican II would be that new Pentecost when the faithful might rekindle the flame and heed the call to fulfill the proclamation of St. Paul to be letters of Christ to each other. Now, it has been 50 years since John's Council, and as you know, we will celebrate the actual event on October 11th. So I have all four of my classes at the college ready for this. They don't know what I'm coming in dressed as, but I'm working on a costume. I haven't decided yet, but it's got to be something that they're going to remember. And they're all getting Dunkin' Donuts because I'm cheap, all right? But we are going, we are going to celebrate this incredible event um, October 11th, 2012. Um, but so we have to ask ourselves here, uh, and that's what we have been doing this weekend while we've been together. Um, let's ask ourselves some questions. What has actually been accomplished? Where are we now? Is the dream over? As my young author that I made reference to earlier um, in, my, in my presentation, what might be the legacy of the 21st century church in this regard. Now, it may be difficult to hear, and it may be overwhelming to realize, but one thing is certain, that legacy is in our hands. And you know, as I look out at you, I'm delighted to see a good number of the students here from, I'm assuming, the University of St. Thomas, because they are our future. They are going to, we are, you know, I love the title of your, of your meeting, you know, teaching and remembering and um, understanding Vatican II after, uh, after 50 years, but that's what we're all about. Most of us here in this room are about teaching these young people so that they become the letters of Christ to the next generation. So I'm delighted that they are here. I'm also delighted because they all know how to use IT, which I don't, and I need to show a DVD at the end of this, so they're in my will, along with a man from Liturgical Press who quite generously gave me a book before, so I hope they like rosaries and photos of John the 23rd, because that's what's in a nun's will, all right? That's what they're getting. For the young among you, think eBay, all right? 
for the old among you think treasures, all right? All right, so where are we now? What has been achieved thus far? What has yet to be done? These are all the kinds of questions that the various people who have been here with us have attempted to answer, have attempted to raise, and I do the same. And how do we impact that legacy of Vatican II today? I offer a, a, a note of caution. Some of the information, at least from my vantage point that I go on to share with you now, is a bit disturbing and is a bit discouraging. Still, I am a Dominican Sister of Hope, and hope is my business. And so, um, at least it's supposed to be my business. I think that if we all take an honest look at the church today, and if we do it, knowing and believing in the promise of the risen Christ to be faithful to the church, all right, then we will remember that that promise is more powerful and more enduring and more significant than any damage or foolishness or harm that we can bring to this church. Yes, we can harm our church. Yes, we can weaken our church, but we cannot destroy our church. Our, we, we inherited this gift that we call church. We cannot destroy it, however hard we might, with all our cleverness. Um, and so the, if we remember that, you know, theologians have that $10 word, the principle of indefectibility, that, you know, that the presence of Christ in the church is stronger than any harm we can do. But if we remember that as we reflect and we look at where we are now in the church, we will not be depressed. We will be further encouraged to go on and tell the story because you know what? Without us, the story dies. Just remember that. Without us, the story dies. Now, as I said, many of us here have lived in two churches, before and after Vatican II. And it is hard not to be impressed by what the council did achieve, at least when you read those 16 documents. We came to see the world as a partner in dialogue and not as an enemy requiring some kind of domination. We came to acknowledge, at least on paper, our errors, our failings, our sins, and we saw the need for the church to be in continual reform. This, of course, was based on the recognition that the church, though divinely guided and divinely founded, is in the hands of humans who are often weak and fra uh, fru uh, frail and wounded. We came to view our church as a communion of the faithful, where all the baptized members have a legitimate voice in the ongoing, st ongoing story that we've been invited to tell. This was, of course, grounded in the council's teaching that there is but one universal vocation, and that is the call to holiness. It will be lived out in different ways, mother, father, doctor, sister, priest, brother, layman, single person, whatever it is, but you and I have the identical calling to be holy. We came to realize, and for those of us who are a little obsessed with Vatican II, and by now you're getting the impression that I might be one of those people, but um, for those of us who are a little obsessed about Vatican II, we all have our special part that touches us the most. And I don't know why necessarily, but this part does it for me. We came to realize that if every person in the universe is the creation of God, and we did believe that all along, then there has to be some way for every single person to be redeemed. This was a remarkable acknowledgement, all right, in a church that had taught right up to the eve of the Second Vatican Council that outside the church there could be no salvation. You know, and then we have that magnificent line from Gaudium et Spes, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, where we read that this is possible in a manner known only to God. You know, I know you heard from Father John O'Malley um, on the first evening of the conference, and one of the things he brings up in his writings about the council is something significant, and it might, it was so subtle that it might slip the minds of some readers of the documents. The whole kind of language that is used in the Vatican II documents is and, and, and the bishop at mass last night brought it up too when he said, we prefer the, uh, the medicine of mercy to the medicine of severity. But O'Malley has made a point that the style of the documents, that they, they are invitational. They are almost like homilies. They are persuasive. They are not um, 
they don't use language of obligation. You can't force love, and you can't force the act of faith. All we can do is present the incredible story that we have, the gospel, and, and then become witnesses of that story in such a way that someone will say, I want that. That's why I became a Dominican sister. The nuns I had in my, in my elementary school, they all seemed so happy. Now, maybe they were killing each other in the convent. I don't know. But when they were there in that classroom, they were happy, smiling, and I said, that's what I want. I want to be happy like that. That's how people, I think, have to look at us and say, that's what I want. If their faith gives them this strength and this power and this, and this peace and this determination not to give in, I w that's what I want. This is what we need to become. Um, and then we became, uh, and so O'Malley's language change is an important one. Reread the documents now that we become more aware of that. The language is gentle, it's more gospel, it's more humble, it's more tentative, and it doesn't water down any of the faith, but it recognizes that Jesus did enforce the faith, and so therefore we can't force it either. We can simply state what the fact or what the truth of the Christian gospel maintains. So also we became a humble church with a human face seemingly aware of our creaturely status and our complete dependence on the grace of Christ to go forward. So, you know, Sister, and I'm not sure I remember her name, Elizabeth, yesterday spoke about the triumphalistic uh, attitude that um, was present in our church at times in the past. That's gone if you read the documents with a certain pair of eyeglasses, because we recognize God is mystery, and we have spent the last 200,000 years, 2,000 years, peeling away at a layer, trying to get a deeper insight into this mystery that we call God. How arrogant would it be to claim that we have all the answers or that we have the fullness of truth? Of course we don't. God is the fullness of truth. We are moving toward that fullness of truth. Still, we're, when we look at where we are today, we have to acknowledge that we simply have not implemented the teachings of the Second Vatican Council as um, successfully as we might have. And we have to ask ourselves some questions. And these questions are particularly important um, as we attempt to tell this story to a new generation. And many of us in this audience are doing just that, that we are trying to tell the story to the next group that will carry on the banner of the Second Vatican Council. So here are some of the questions that we have to ask ourselves. Have we lost the momentum? Have we forgotten what it was like to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in such an incredible way? Think of the enthusiasm of those days. You know, when one bishop was asked um, at the Second Vatican Council who he thought the most impressive presence at the council was, he said, well, I'm sure a lot of people would probably say Pope John the 23rd, and others would say Pope Paul the Sixth. But he said, for me, I would have to say it was the Holy Spirit whose presence was almost palpable. Secondly, how could it be that all the achievements and the many, many more that I have alluded to above, which have, are, are found in the documents? I didn't make that stuff up. Remember, I said nuns do not lie. Not about things like this. Truly and truly. These things are found in the documents. So how have they failed to be implemented sufficiently in our time? What do we do now? How do we genuinely remember? Now, I think a conference like this is a perfect example of how we genuinely remember that moment. And I commend this university for taking the time and the effort and all the work that goes into it to make this a moment of remembrance. But how do we bring it to life again for our next generation? How do we not give in to frustration? This is an important one. How do we stay faithful to the tradition that gives us life and sustains us with the gift of the Holy Spirit? How do we encourage each other to grow in that spirit and to give witness to that spirit? And a question that is asked in so many contemporary books today and articles and one that we're grappling with, um, how is it that after all this time, 
the church at large entertains such different interpretations of what actually happened at Vatican II and different interpretations of how the church should be interpreting those documents for us today. It is, it is amazing to me. Now, these are hard questions, but if we are going to be letters of Christ, if we are sincere about the witness that we have been invited to give the world, then we cannot ignore these questions. As you know, in the fall of 2010, Benedict XVI went to Great Britain to beatify Cardinal John Henry Newman. Newman, as you know, had been an Anglican priest, converted to the Roman Catholic Church in the 18th century, and became one of our greatest theologians. Many of the ideas that he would put forward in the 1850s would finally come to fruition 100 years later at the Second Vatican Council, so much so that at one point, Pope Paul VI referred to Vatican II as Newman's Council. He was a prophetic voice in his time. In 1976, an expert on the works of Newman wrote the following, quote, at Vatican II, the tides of clericalism, over-centralization, creeping infallibility, and a misguided understanding of private spirituality were put into a better perspective while the things that Newman championed came forward. What did Newman believe in? Freedom, supremacy of conscience, we assume an informed conscience, the church as communion rather than primarily as a hierarchical structure, a return to the proper reading of scripture, the rightful place of the layperson in the church, and the efforts to meet the needs of the new age and the church taking its place in the modern world. Now yet, a reading of current theological newspapers and magazines, etc., seem to indicate a kind of regression, an apparent desire on the part of some in the church to move back to what might be called the good old days before Vatican II. And most of you are aware from your ministries that there are many concerns today as the church evaluates and interprets that moment we call Vatican II. Concerns about the legitimate roles of women in the church. And I say that not because I'm a woman. I mean, it is just simply so much a part of the contemporary literature that it's, it, it cannot be ignored. The need for additional ways for the laity to legitimately, legitimately have a role in the church. We gave them a wonderful document at Vatican II, a marvelous document, but I, I dare to say it has not t taken wing in the last 40 or 50 years. We need to find a way to give that document wings. The continuing horror experienced over the clergy sexual abuse. We became aware of it in 2002, and yet, if you open any international newspaper or theological journal, the story continues to haunt us today. We still find more cases of that. We all know what that does to our credibility as an institutional church. Right? It is a problem that we deal with. All right, so, so many of these concerns are written about, and they're discussed in journals and newspapers. I think to myself, I can't help but think they must be on the minds of church authorities. But those of us in the pews, those of us who are serving the faithful in our ministries, we don't have the ability to really change these issues, primarily because we don't have the authority all right, the Episcopal authority is that which makes the kinds of major changes that I believe we are looking to make today. And so we don't have, we're not the official um, body of teachers, but we're not without a voice and we're not without a responsibility. If we mean it, when we say we want to be letters of Christ, if we mean it, when we say that this group of people, are, we want to pass on to this young uh, group of people a renewed faith, a vibrant faith to this generation, then I think we have to look forward. 
Catholics are, Roman Catholics are bound by the teachings of an ecumenical council. And so I think it's fair to ask ourselves, especially at this anniversary moment, and I think it's appropriate to ask those in our ministry to um, these questions as well. What do we really know about the teachings of the Second Vatican Council? Have we tried to incorporate them into our own lives and our own ministries? And maybe the $64,000 question, have we read them? Have we read the 16 documents? When I think of the sacrifices that so many people put into the making of those documents, they deserve at least that we read them. So what if we dare to be who Christ wants us to be? What if we allowed ourselves to be that, those signs of Christ's healing and transforming power? You know, scripture is very clear on this. Again, we don't read it literally, but the words must mean something. It's very challenging. We read in the second letter to the Corinthians, examine yourselves to see whether you are living the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Do we? The only way that we can authentically ask others in our church, especially those in our ministries, but even those in official church positions, the only way we can ask them to give witness to this story is if you and I are giving witness to this gospel and to this story ourselves. It's that simple and it's that hard. And that's why the legacy of Vatican II is really in our hands. We are the church. And yet it would seem at this time that we are at a crossroads. You know, um, do we honor, remember, and continue to implement Vatican II? Do we accept the call to be letters of Christ to each other? Again, relying on some thoughts of Joan Chittister, she said frequently when you reach a moment of crossroads, you know, which direction do we go now? We seem to be so confused. She offers three possible options that we can take when facing these cr this crossroad moment. One, she said the first is simply to quit the road that is going nowhere. We can move out, move on, and leave the mission unfinished. The second choice is to give in to the fatigue that comes from years of waiting and go you know, uh, silently into oblivion. We could crawl into a comfortable place with people who think the way we do and just go on living our own lives untouched by the whatever is going on outside us. Um, the third choice, she says, however, is to follow the path of the prophets. And um, she said, those who spoke before us but who were not heard until after the fact. Prophets are those who take life as it is and expand it. And one of my favorite lines, which I think, I always tell my students if something is important, which means you're gonna see it on the blue book, you know, you should tattoo this somewhere, and of course they do. Because <laughs> they, my students are still afraid of me and I kinda like that, all right? Um, but I love this line from Chittister. She said, the prophets simply refused to limit the vision of tomorrow by the boundaries of today. Very, very powerful. So we must not forget that the prophets, like us, were discouraged by the present moment. They got weary from trying. And they, too, had to face these three options. But in the end, Every one of them, when they faced the moment, when they thought they might quit, chose instead to go on. They chose to go on, if not with a sense of total and complete success, but rather as planters of the seed, as eternal reminders to their people. They chose to go on illuminating others, shouting the message upon which the future rested, our future rests on what we say today and the message upon which the people depended. Our people need to hear this story. Now, you and I know these people. Simple, sincere, eager, inspired, these struggling lovers, these sometimes suffering witnesses who have made these choices. You and I know these people who chose courage. Indeed, 
because you and I are those people. That's why you are here today. Some final thoughts. Today I wanted to speak about memory and reform. I do not want anyone, any of us, to forget Vatican II, to consign it to the past as though it has no bearing on our present and absolutely no bearing on our future. Too many people made too many sacrifices so that Vatican II might possibly serve as a vehicle for the work of the Holy Spirit in our time. Many of those theologians were prophets among us, among them some of my great brother theologian Dominicans, you know, Yves Congar and Marie Dominique Chenu, all right, the great Jesuits, Henri de Lubeck, Karl Rahner, right? These great, great men, these prophets among us made so many sacrifices so that you and I would sit here today and reflect on this. They often suffered for their convictions. In the decades prior to the council, many of them were silenced by their official church, unable to preach, to publish, to teach. All right, because, and they weren't coming up with something outlandish. They were rediscovering what they found in the New Testament and in the fathers of the church, the patristics. All right, and so they were being punished for doing what theologians do digging deeper into the mystery we call God. That is maybe the best definition of what a theologian does. And it would be John the 23rd who would invite these men back to the council and serve as the pariti, the theological experts to the bishops. Sadly, many of the prophets did not live long enough to see the fruits of their labor. And when I related this fact in my book on Vatican II, I remember feeling very sad that they never saw what they were able to bring about. But then I came across another quote that was attributed to the Zen master. Um, the seed never sees the flower. And I can't tell you how inspired I was by the thought. Maybe that's what you and I are being called to be at this moment, at this juncture in history. Maybe you and I are being called to be the seed. I don't know. The seed never sees the flower. I hope my students will see the flower. I pray for that every day. Because only God sees the fullness of truth. Only God sees the complexity of the present human situation with eyes that fully understand. That is why the greatest definition, the one offered by Karl Rahner when he talked about God, he said, God basically is mystery. And he says, by mystery, I don't mean that which I cannot understand. I mean that which I can never fully exhaust. That liberates me as a theologian then I, it does liberate me. I, am, I spend every day, every hour, every class trying to dig deeper and deeper into a mystery that when I finally go to my deathbed, I will have countless more questions. Of course, then when I do finally meet this God for whom I have been planning to meet, um, then those questions will go away. But this is where we are at this point. The only legitimate human response to this God, I believe, is one of some sincere surrender, genuine faith in that which is yet to be seen. Please don't misunderstand my use of the word surrender. I don't mean throwing our hands up and saying, fine, uncle, have it your way. This is a theological surrender. This is an acknowledgment that this is a God that the human mind cannot fully comprehend. This is a God who loves unconditionally. This is a God who wants us to be returned and spend eternity with this God for always. But for whatever reason, we do not have the tools to fully comprehend. So it causes us to be cautious, tentative, humble, and grateful, and always tenuous in our movements as we move toward this mystery. In John the 23rd's opening address at the council, he said, amazingly that he said this because, as you may know, at the very same time, we were in the throes of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The civil rights movement was going on. And over in Rome, you have a 70-something-year-old man saying, quote, 
In the present order of things, divine providence is heading us to a new order of human relations, which by humanity's own efforts and even beyond its expectations are directed toward the fulfillment of God's superior and inscrutable designs. This is God's show. We just get to be the players. We get to be the ones on stage. But this is God's drama, all right, unfolding all right, of salvation history. Only a few years ago, Cardinal William Casper, who was present at the council, said, I myself have no doubt that the council's finest hour is still to come, that its seed will spring up and bear fruit. Another theologian wrote, the divine sculpture seems to be fashioning a new form of church for the third millennium, but that form is still hidden in the marble. When will we finally begin to really trust in the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst? We profess it in all our official documents, but in practice, do we really believe it? The council is not over. It is not a then. It is a now, if we but make it so. We are members of a church that has always known how to reform, have always found a way to be transformed. We are the church. We, are, we have a voice. Do we dare not tell this story to a new generation? You know, as St. Paul tells us, you and I have been called to be stewards of God's great mystery. That great mystery, he goes on to describe, is Jesus Christ. Clearly, John the 23rd proved himself to be an incredible steward and can serve as an inspiration for all of us as we move forward. You know, the deep admiration and the respect that I have for this man um, and the gift that he was to our church is really no surprise to anyone who knows me because I do believe, as one of his commentators said, I do believe he was a manifestation of the spirit in our time, which, by the way, each of us is called to be. We are each in called to be a man. When you see me, you are supposed to be seeing the risen Christ. You are supposed to be seeing the God I carry within me. I don't always succeed at that, but he did. People saw him, and they felt the presence of God. You know, in one of John's biographers wrote about the final days of John the 23rd. And as many of you may know, his last days were filled with suffering from cancer. Uh, the author wrote that on June 3rd, 1963, the day the Pope died, that John woke up at 3 a.m. and said twice, Lord, you know that I love you. I want to believe this author's account of it um, because based on the author's account, these were the last words spoken by John before he died. And I remember reading that thinking, you know, can I even imagine what a blessing it would be if those could be my final words, all right, um, before leaving this particular stage of my journey. And I thought, surely God's response, you know, to John must have been well done. Good and faithful servant, you have been a witness to the hope that I brought to the world. Now, this is what you and I have been called to do. Be witness to the hope that Jesus Christ brought to the world. To conclude my presentation, one of the reasons why I love what the University of St. Thomas is doing is that they recognize not just announcing what Vatican II is, but in their very title, they say, teaching and understanding. And so I would like to show you a DVD that was, it's only five minutes long, that was put together by one of my students in the fall of 2010 when I taught a, the course on um, Vatican II that I teach at St. Anselm College. And I thought, when I finished watching the DVD, I thought, she gets it. And sometimes when I am discouraged, and sometimes when I think, I don't know if I'm getting through. Maybe I'm just humoring myself. But then I look at Kristen Raymond's video, and I say, um, 
this younger generation can be touched. We can reach them. They are open. They, they, they are believers. But we've got to be able to tell the story in a way, with a language that gives life to them. Are you ready? try your best but you don't succeed when you get what you want but not what you need when you feel so tired but you can't sleep stuck in And the tears come streaming down your face When you lose something you can't replace When you love someone but it goes to waste Could it be
Hello. Um, if I understood the first question about the indefectibility principle, um, I, I didn't hear what you thought that might lead to, to an overly... Oh, oh no, no, no. What it is, um, the way it is presented in theology classes or in courses is that, um, uh, or Theologians will use it to say, because of the human element that is in the church, sometimes we do fear. Sometimes we say, you know, when we had the, the clergy abuse, uh, which was at its height, all right, people were walking away and people were saying, I don't want to belong to a church like that. I don't want to be a member. What that principle does is it doesn't defend the member nor does it defend the priestly caste or anything like that. What it basically is, it's a, it's a reaffirmation of a promise that was made by the risen Christ to the whole church that because we do, there are theologians, um, you know, if you study over the last 2,000 years, who talk about the magisterium of the people of God. If by virtue of the Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit being in all of us, we all have a voice of truth, then there is something unique about us coming together. So it was, it's more of that teaching on that principle is more of a, a confirmation of the fact of, don't worry, um, you're not going to be able to destroy something that God has begun. That's how I meant the term. And it should never make us defensive or arrogant if at anything we realize that it's only on a dependence of God's grace that we are able to move forward in that. Your, the second part of your question um, is disturbing to me because um, you, it's, how should I put it? Um, we've all seen evidence of a certain dualism that exists in our 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 church. Um, for me, I've I've gone through many stages of how best to deal with it, and the way that um, I'm a Dominican, you know, and the Dominican tradition is to contemplate and to give to others the fruits of your contemplation, and so I've 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 consoled myself with the fact that I can't do it all even though sometimes I think I can, but I can't do it all. But what I can do is I will make an intellectual argument, a case for a truth of something, and that's all I can do. So I will prepare myself as a theologian. I will be as ready as I possibly can. And I think that's why my students, like Kristen, could respond, because all of a sudden something like a Vatican II made sense. She, those are graphics she chose, you know, and she chose those words from Gaudium et Spes and Lumen Gentium that affect the very people that are suffering and whatever. So if we can show a connection of the validity of whatever we're trying to say with the world in which they're living, then I don't know that there's much more that we can't do it all. We'll, we'll do our corner of the world, but we've got to do it in our corner because if we don't, then the story dies right here in the University of St. Thomas. Yes.
Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking Manchester once, to tell you the truth, it would be right in my backyard and I would love it, all right. Oh, yeah. You know what, thank you so much for that question because um, that question got me into a little bit of trouble this past week. Um, I was interviewed for our local newspaper in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, they were doing a story on Vatican II and the interviewer asked me that question. And I'm going to defer to my brothers and sister theologians in the audience who can correct me on this, but there are some matters that I think are of such a serious nature in the church today that can only be changed by Episcopal authority, all right? And so, for example, for the longest time, I thought, no, we, can't, we don't need Vatican III. We haven't implemented Vatican II sufficiently yet, and we haven't. But there are a couple of things. I'm, I'm going to single out two issues that really worry me and uh, are of great concern to me as a person and as a theologian in the church that I love. Um, and that is... Um, I do not think that in the 50 years since the council ended, we came even close to bringing about a healthy understanding of Episcopal collegiality, which would be the, you know, the, the, the shared governance of the church in such a way that there would be a level of, of autonomy on some issues so that the Church of Africa which has issues that the Church of Manchester, New Hampshire is never going to have, so that there is some leeway, so that there is some legitimate, and Vatican II said, the bishop is not the vicar of the pope, the bishop is the vicar of Christ in his diocese. So I'd love, I feel we need to do more on Episcopal collegiality, and I don't see that happening without another world council. That's number one. Um, the other issue that, um, that hurts my heart a great deal is the role of women in the church. Uh, you just saw a DVD that was put together by a female. And Kristen Raymond is a nurse. She's working at a hospital in Massachusetts. And I want young women like her to feel welcomed and sought after and, and be the kind of lay voice in our church um, and so, again, ordination is not a concern of mine. I personally do not feel called to ordination. I feel called to religious life, and I've been happy for over 47 years in that capacity, so I think I'm good to go. I don't think I'm waiting for something to happen. I don't mean good to go to God, although if I, I, it wouldn't be bad celebrating the 50th anniversary with John the 23rd. That would be too cool for words, but... Um, <laughs> But I, I, my heart hurts that I look out at this audience, and I know we've, we've heard it all before, 85% of the church's ministry in the United States is, in, is at the hands of females. Um, uh, it, one's not better, one's not worse, but that's why I think loving works so well, because there is this complementarity. I'd love to see the complementarity of what we women might bring to a church and, um, and, and learn from each other. So, and yet that is not going to change anytime soon because it would require, again, Episcopal activity. And I don't think right now that the, the bishops are of such a mind that they're comfortable acting on their own. So collegiality, I think, has to be revisited and as such for me, and that's why I'm deferring to my brother and sister theologians who know more on that, I think something like that would require another coming together as a council to revisit 
what we did not quite um, finish up on those two issues or we didn't find a way to take care of in the last 50 years. But I got into trouble because some people thought, because my bishop uh, responded in the same article, I should tell you, uh, in Manchester that, um, you know, I don't really quite disagree, I don't really quite agree with Sister Maureen's perception that there, we need a Vatican through. Three, I think we, you know, and he went on to say bringing out some old China and, and relishing what we had in the past. And so I haven't seen my bishop since the article was held, but it might be interesting, okay? Do you have any openings in the department here? <laughs> I've been so busy learning and loving more and more and more about it that um, I think there must be something of a sociological, analytical, whatever going on in terms of someone else is better suited to say, what happened, you know, to answer that question. I'm not sure. I think fear of, of um, the freedoms that, um, that emerged as a result of the council and the need to sort of pull back. I think there are two models of church that are currently at odds with each other. You know, they're always usually referred to as the pyramid versus the communion. But um, th I understand those who like the pyramid model. It um, brings about a certain level of certitude and everyone knows where there are and what the right place is and what's black and what's white. The, s the communion model is much messier but I think the communion model is so much more genuine in terms of the complexity of the human situation and opens the door for you and me to talk and dialogue and raise questions. So I think church models, you know, Armie de Lubeck said something wonderful um, at the end or toward the end of the council. He said something like, when people lose um, uh, an approach toward God, they think they have lost God. And clearly, the neo-scholastic, you know, the 13th century approach to God that saw him in a classicist, immutable fashion, you know, before Vatican II, um, we lost that. We, we, we sort of assumed the New Testament communal, that God continues to create in this beautiful universe that we have. Um, and so he says, but when people lose something like that, they think they've lost God. He said, we didn't lose God. We lost an, a way of articulating that God. But God has been there all along. And I think that's another factor. I think the, the, the need to learn a new language to speak about this God is quite challenging. And um, same old, same old works good sometimes. Yeah, yes. Maybe um, that's the third thing on the agenda for the next council, <laughs> because you're exactly right. Um, you know, like let's say Voice of the Faithful or SNAP, just in that case alone, all right? They've been calling for accountability on a certain matter for a long time and they haven't gotten it. So it just seems that we, we don't seem to have the, the authority or, or the, the whatever it takes to make it happen. And so I think maybe, Again, a church council would, you know, we lost a huge treasure at the end of August in Carlo Martini, the Cardinal of Milan. And I mean, I, r I have read everything I possibly can because he has been one of my incredible heroes. And if you read the tablet, which is p uh, published in Great Britain, there's the, his last interview is there, and then there's a lovely article about him by someone who knew him from his teaching days. But I thought, this is the church I want to belong to. This is what I want. I want for my bishop to be able to say, and not apart from the one that I have, I'm just speaking ideally, just in case I'm being, you know, taped. 
I'm already in enough trouble <laughs> calling for Vatican III, but seriously, um, that's what I want. And I really think a Carlo Martini would have said to you, sure, what's the problem? But apparently, we, there's something preventing that kind of accountability, and so maybe we do need another formal coming together where people like yourself, because it can't just be the bishops coming together at that meeting. If I'm not invited, I'm making a scene, okay? I'm making a terrible scene. I want to be at whatever that next council is, because the, the women have to be there, our young people have to be there, our lay people have to be there, and we are the church. We say it a thousand times, but um, if we don't get a forum in which that church can really say, like you just said today, then we're just fooling ourselves. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernie.